Hello and welcome to this video on diodes. Uh, in previous videos we've looked at a range of different concepts in electronics and electrical engineering and we've always looked at circuits that involve resistors, resistive circuits, but in this video we're going to start to look at diodes. So this symbol here that uh, might be new to you is the symbol for a diode and we're going to look over a couple of videos at diodes and how they behave in circuits. Now in this video we're going to simplify things a little bit um, and we're going to look at what we call ideal diodes. Ideal diodes are where we make some assumptions about how diodes behave and we simplify things a little bit. But in the next video we're going to look at diodes in a little bit more detail. But for now we're just keeping things simple and looking at ideal diodes. So the simplest way to think about a diode is a component that only allows current to flow in one direction. So if we put a diode in one direction in the circuit, it will allow current to flow. But then if we turn that diode around, we'll actually find that it prevents current from flowing. Uh, the best way to think about this, or to remember which way around a diode should go if we want current to flow, is to look at this sort of triangle shape of the diode. And the, think of it as more like an arrow which is pointing in the direction of current flow. So in this case, the diode is in what we could call the correct way in the sense that current, if we think of current flowing from positive to negative, so current flows around the circuit in this direction, it matches up with the direction of that triangle, that arrow there. So this diode here is in what we call forward bias. And what we mean by that is it will allow current to flow. So forward bias um, is the term we use there. We can imagine that that diode, if it's in forward bias, it's not preventing the current from flowing at all. Um, it's not impeding the current at all. So we can almost think of it as just like a wire. We can imagine that we could replace that diode with just a wire. And so what we find is, if, if we were to imagine we were measuring the voltage across the components here, so I'll, I'll, I'll put in a, a sort of imaginary voltmeter here. If we measure the voltage across the resistor VR, so I'll imagine that I've got a voltmeter connected across it like so. And if we imagine a, another voltmeter VD measuring across the diode, what we'll find in an ideal diode, and again we're making some assumptions here, but because the diode is, is not impeding the current at all, because it's, it's just allowing current to flow, we can think of it as a wire, and a wire has no resistance. And if it has no resistance, it has no voltage. So we can imagine that that voltmeter would give us a value of zero volts there. And likewise, if we think back to Kirchhoff's voltage law, the sum of the voltage supplied must be equal to the sum of the voltages dropped. So let's imagine this is a 9 volt battery. Well, I would expect to measure all of that 9 volts across the resistor there, because none of it is going to be dropped across the diode if it's if it's allowing current to flow completely as it does in this this ideal sense let's have a look at the opposite case now so if you imagine now we've turned that diode around so now this diode is what we call reverse bias and reverse bias is simply to say that we've put the diode in the the wrong way as such um, and and now current can't flow so what we see here is that current is not able to flow around this circuit because the diode is pointing against the direction of the current flow from positive to negative. Now in this case, again, I'll imagine that I'm connecting some imaginary voltmeters up here, I'm measuring the voltage across the resistor, VR, and I'm measuring the voltage across the diode, VD. Well, because there's no current in this circuit, if we think of V equals I times R, the voltage across the resistor must be zero. So zero volts we'll measure in this case. And it's actually the opposite situation now. Let's say again we've got a nine volt battery. Because we can imagine that that diode has what we could consider as infinite resistance, it's preventing all the current from flowing, then it drops all of that nine volts across that, uh, across that diode there. So again, we're thinking of things in a, in a very simple sense. Let's have a look now at a, a more complicated example of a network that involves resistors and diodes. And you can see here I've got a, a parallel arrangement of three resistors in parallel. Um, so three current branches going through R1, R2 and R3. 
but I've also got some diodes in the mix as well. And these diodes are either going to prevent uh, current from flowing or allow current to flow, depending on the direction. So let's have a look at this circuit and think about which currents are going to be allowed to flow here. So first of all, remembering that current flows from positive uh, to negative, so currents flowing sort of around in this direction. Well, first of all, we can think of these three currents, and I'll mark them on here, as I1, I2, and I3. Well, let's look at I1 first of all, and we can say that I1 is going to be allowed to flow because you can see that the direction of the current is matching up with the direction of the diode. I2, on the other hand, is not going to be allowed to flow, so we're not going to have a value for I2, or it'll be a value of zero, because the diode is preventing the current from flowing down that branch. And then finally, I3 doesn't have a diode, so we can, we can be sure that I3 will have a value of current there. Let's try and work out some of the um, values in this circuit. I want to work out the total resistance and, and the, the current in this circuit. Um, so let's begin by looking at the total resistance in this circuit. Well, we said that we had three resistors in parallel, and we also said that one of those resistors, or one of those current paths, I2, is being prevented from allowing current to flow. And so we can actually exclude that branch, that I2 branch, from the circuit. So we're only left with R1 and R3 that are in play here. And like we said before, they're in parallel. So we're going to calculate, first of all, the total resistance of our circuit. I'll call it RT for the total resistance. And we can say that uh, the total resistance is R1 in parallel with R3. So I'll just make a little shorthand here. Uh, we'll say that uh, that's 560 in parallel with 390. Now that double slash there is just my shorthand for, for in parallel. I'm going to skip the working out here. If you're not sure on how to work out resistors in parallel, I would suggest going back to the video on series and parallel resistors where we talk about how to work that out. But for those two resistors in parallel, I get a value of 229.89 ohms. So the total resistance for this whole circuit excluding R2, because R2 is prevented from being part of the circuit by that diode in reverse bias, we can see that the total resistance is just R1 and R3 in parallel, which comes out as 229.89 ohms. The next thing we can do is we can work out the supply current. So that current that emerges from the supply, we'll call it IS, and we can calculate IS now just using Ohm's law. Let's imagine that, again, my battery here is a 9-volt battery. So what we can do is we can use Ohm's law. We can say IS is equal to VS divided by the total resistance. So let's try and work that out. We can say that that's 9 divided by 229.89 uh, ohms, and that gives me a value of... Uh, 0.03915 amps, but better than that, we can multiply by a thousand and I'll get a value of 39.15 milliamps. Finally, we've got these two separate currents here, I1 and I3. We said that I2 isn't really in the mix with this circuit because it's been prevented by that diode, but we've got these two separate currents, I1 and I3. And because they're in parallel, they actually share the same voltage. We, we said in a previous video that any, any resistances in parallel share the same voltage. And so both of those currents, or both of those resistors, R1 and R3, they get the same 9 volt supply. Um, so we can work out these currents separately as well. We can say that I1 is equal to 9 divided by 560. And for that, I get a value of 16.07 times 10 to the minus 3, or 16.07 milliamps. And I'll mark that I1, sorry. I3 is our last current there. I3 
is the same voltage, 9, divided by 390. And in this case, I get an answer of 23.08 milliamps. So we've got those two separate currents there, I1 and I3. Now, you might have already spotted, but like we talked about in our video on Kirchhoff's current law, the current entering a junction is equal to the sum of the currents leaving that junction. So we can say, or we can assume, that the supply current, IS, must be the same as the separate currents in this circuit. And what we find is that's the case. If you look at the value for IS, 39.15, it's equal to the sum of our two separate currents, I1 and I3, added together. So this video is just meant to be a, a very simple introduction to diodes and how they behave in circuits. But remember here, we're looking at ideal diodes. We've made some simplifications here. In the next video, we're going to look at diode characteristics in more detail.